Access Fort Wayne offers reflections of our community. Production facilities provided by Access Fort Wayne are a service of the Allen County Public Library. The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily represent those of Access Fort Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting organizations. For more information about creating your own television program with Access Fort Wayne, call 421-1250. Hello, and welcome to our show, The American Veteran. I'm Dale Parrish, your host, Carl Fowler, his co-host, and also setting in with us this morning is uh, Jim Winnie, World War II vet, and also a uh, Korean veteran. Uh, our guest today is Mark Young. Mark, uh, welcome to the show. Mark is a uh, Desert Storm veteran. Yes, sir. Now, when did you uh, join the Navy? Uh, I enlisted in the Navy in uh, 1987, late 1987. I actually entered uh, boot camp in 21 December, and then I graduated in February. Is that for a four-year? Yes, sir. Okay. So you was already warmed up and ready for a desert storm? Yes, sir. Actually, <laughs> uh, the um, <clears throat> when I had gotten attached to my ship, we had. Uh, we had already made one trip to the Persian <coughs> Gulf as, as part of the escort crews that were running through there in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, they were escorting the oil tankers at that time because of tensions in the Gulf. So we went over there as a, as a uh, protectionary force the first trip, and that was in 89. And then we went back in 90 for, for uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Yeah. I read right. somewhere that the Navy was actually a, had presence over there for 40 years or more. We've actually had presence in the Indian Ocean, Persian Gulf area for a lot longer than that. I believe it's it's on the upwards of 60 years. 60, yeah, great. Mm -hmm. And they'll be there for a while, I think, too. Yes, sir. Yeah. Rotating ships, is that it? Uh, yes, sir. Go over for a tour of duty and then come back and right. somebody replaces you? And um, I know that it's changed in reading some of the online articles and that. I know that deployments have changed now. They're, they're reaching eight, nine, ten months at a time, depending on where you're your ship is home ported at. Um, our they, deployments were six months for a, yeah. for a regular deployment. Our Desert Storm deployment was over eight months. Um, when we left in August of 90, I believe. When we left in August, we t were told we don't know when we're coming back. We were in it for the long haul. Yeah. Mm. What the type, go ahead, go. When you're over there, then you're resupplied by other sh supply ships or what? Uh, yes, sir. We, uh, we don't travel alone. Um, my ship was part of a task force that went over with 10,000 Marines. So we had 13 ships in our task force. We had uh, a helicopter carrier. We had some smaller protection ships. We, had, uh, we were a troop transport. We had some beach landing craft. We had helicopters. We had um, support ships, supply ships that came out from East Africa that would come up into the Gulf to resupply us. Yeah. So you actually carried troops? Yes, sir. 1,500 Marines. 1,500. It got very crowded on that ship. <laughs> I can imagine. They're all up on deck as much as possible, right? Yes. Was the ship armed? Uh, mildly. Uh, we had uh, two large gun, what we called large gun employments. Those were three inch 50 caliber guns. Yeah. Um, and then we had uh, the smaller um, computer-controlled chain guns for shooting down missiles and that, that type oh, of thing. Okay, yeah. that's those round turret type Yeah, it looks like, a, looks like a, a pop can with a round top yeah. on it, got a gun yeah. sticking out of the front yeah. of it. Generally painted white? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. Typically shoots a thousand rounds a minute. I was gonna say those are deadly, aren't they? Yes, sir. <laughs> it's all radar controlled. Once, once you get into theater, you turn the computer on and all you have to do is reload it when it calls for shells because mm -hmm. it tracks its own um, tracks its own targets, and it will determine when the target is no longer a threat and shut itself off. Mm -hmm. well, like shooting ducks with a lead ahead? Oh, yes. Radar controlled, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's got its own tracking radar built right into it, separate from the ship systems. Oh, my God. 
I think I, they probably come out with those about the same time I had the coal, right? <clears throat> that was before the coal. The coal was actually armed with uh, three or four of those mounts. Um, this weapon system was introduced in the mid 70s, early to mid 70s oh, on okay. the aircraft carriers. I was going to say, I've know, seen them on <coughs> aircraft carriers and that. Aircraft carriers are the big target, you know, they're the oh, yeah. big money piece, sure, so yeah. you have to protect them first, and they were typically a missile target for opposing sure. aircraft. So that's where they were originally designed for. Most aircraft carriers run four to six of them, three on each side. Okay, so the armament on your ship was mostly defensive? Mildly defensive. Our, our primary go mission is not really support not of the beach. No, we're not <coughs> an attack vessel, we're a transport. Yeah. Um, we had a well deck in the back, a big tailgate, like a, like a pickup truck. You drop the tailgate, you flood the ballast tanks, and you, and you launch a 140 foot long landing craft. Mm. And that'll transport the Marines to the beach. They pull up on the beach, drop the bow ramp, and they go out and play in the sand. 140 okay. foot. 140 foot yeah. landing craft, yeah. and it's about 30 feet wide. So we've got an area inside the ship that's, it's, I mean, the ship is built like a pickup truck in the back with side walls and a, and a base yeah. that's about 60 feet wide and 200 feet long. And we loaded everything. We had vehicles, we had trucks, tanks, Jeeps, trailers full of ammunition and supplies and everything else up inside the ship. And we would. Well, like an LSD. Uh, we were the we were the big brother to the LSTs. Um, the USS Raleigh was commissioned in 1963 as the first kind of an upgrade to an LST. The LSTs actually went up and hit the beach, yeah. and the and the landing craft that we carried, the LCUs, were the smaller brother to the LSTs. They just they make more trips hmm. to the mm -hmm. beach, but they they're the ones that go up and hit the sand, yeah. and we are the ones that were the parking space, so to speak, the parking garage for everything. <laughs> so that they could go up, unload a little bit, and come back and, and keep okay. making trips to the uh, beach. Yeah, I was gonna say, you, he goes up and back, can you open up and put more in, he goes again? Oh yes, Yeah. yes. We had uh, many different ways of setting it up. We could do it dry or wet. I mean, if you wanna do it wet, you can just leave the ship ballasted down, mm -hmm. and when they get done at the beach, they come back out and they drive right up inside, mm -hmm. drop the bow ramp on a, on a ramp inside the ship, we load it up full of full of Marines and full of trucks, and he backs out the back door and he goes and does it again. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. you know, that's something I, I've never seen one of those ships, but uh, I, I imagine they were quite useful. Yes, sir. Yeah. Does that actually float into the ship? Or yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, had, the, the ship goes down. We had ballast yeah. tanks like a submarine. Oh, okay. Yeah. We would take on several hundred thousand that. gallons of seawater. And the back end of the ship would actually sink down to where we had uh, about eight feet of water over the deck inside the ship. So it was a 12 or 14 <coughs> foot transition from normal cruising depth down to a wet well operation. Something like a dry dock. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Just like a dry dock. Mm -hmm. How big was this ship overall? 530 feet long. Okay. 121 <coughs> feet wide at its widest point, 122 feet, I think. How big a crew did they have? 350, approximately. 350. And um, it got, <clears throat> we got very used to having a lot of room to, to be able to exist, I guess, on a ship without the Marines on board. We only carried the Marines when we were deployed for right. an operation. So we've got all these excess crew areas, or not crew, but uh, Marine Corps areas, birthing compartments and storage and everything else that the ship crew, ship's company is responsible for when the Marines are not there. But when the Marines come on board, now you've got a 530 foot long ship with 350 regular crew and 13 to 1500 Marines, plus all their helicopters and their tanks and Jeeps and trucks and everything else. It gets kind of crowded. Shoulder to shoulder. Yes, sir. <coughs> yes, sir. Shoulder to shoulder. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't want to carry the Marines all the time because you wouldn't want to feed them and everything else. No, <laughs> definitely not. I mean, it, it uh, got- So really unless they're going on a mission, something this way why you wouldn't you wouldn't have them on board correct they would uh, they we we would train together occasionally but most of the time the Marines would do their training and we would do our training there are two different categories of stuff that we need to sure. do um, every like six months before a, a deployment we would get together and do uh, workups where practice we practice right bring on a detachment of Marines put them on board you know carry them around for 
two, th two, three weeks, make landings on the beach. We'd storm the beach of Virginia, I don't know, eight or ten times a month. <laughs> Get them accustomed to what is expected of them. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you just mentioned Marines. How about our, the Army? Uh, the Army did all of their own transporting. Okay. They, they typically flew in. Um, I know they've got some troop transports. The Air Force does a lot of transporting for the Army. Um, they, they flew over. As a matter of fact, Desert Storm was one of the first highly publicized wars where the United States military was using commercial aircraft to transport their troops. I see. They'd call up <clears throat> an airline, I don't know which ones, but they'd call up an airline and say, hey, look, I've got 10,000 troops and all their equipment. I need to get over there. I'll send the equipment on a C-130, but I need to get my troops over there. Yeah. So they'd commission Charter. Or not, charter. charter. There it yeah. is. That's the word I was looking for. They would charter an airliner, mm -hmm. fill it full of, of troops, send them over there. Sure. Win-win mm -hmm. okay. for both the military and the airlines. Yes, sir. Gets everybody there in a hurry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, they had over, they had three or 400,000 troops over there yeah. during yeah. Desert, Desert Storm. Yeah. Right. My task force that we went over with 13 ships, 13 primary, uh, they called them combatants, we were troop transport. We didn't go in and do any fighting, but we carried, so we're considered a combatant. Thirteen of those, and that, in that we carried ten thousand troops. Hmm. So that was just our, you know. So if you had to go ashore, you could with the troops. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the marine, yeah. the marines are the infantry of the fighting force of the navy. Uh, so the navy transports the marines. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Because that's that's a branch of the Navy. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. It's a very, very, very hotly contested point between the Navy uh, and the I, Marine Corps. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Marines want to be independent. The Marine, you know, it's, everybody thinks it's as the four branches. Well, it is four branches, but it's, you know, mm -hmm. Army, Navy, Air Force, and right now it's the Coast Guard. Coast Guard used to be part of the Navy, but it's not. It's kind of its own little thing. It's kind of a separate organization. Right. But the Marine Corps is, is and has been a part of the Navy. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate the Coast Guard, even though the, they may not be militarized. They're absolutely necessary. Because they're serving their country, right? Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Yeah, they're absolutely necessary. We appreciate anybody that's serving their country in a military manner. The Coast Guard protects our coast and, and protects us so that our military, our straight up military, Army, Navy, and Marines can go and do the fighting right. to protect us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any memorable experience? Or lots of them? Oh, there's a whole list of them. I've got a couple of different ones. Um, I, I've studied, my dad was not in the military, but we come from a military family. So I've done a lot of studying on military operations and how we get things done. And the one thing that really surprised me or really interested me when I was growing up was the logistical side of, of an operation. I mean, you look at D-Day, that was a million man landing on the beach in Normandy with 20 different countries supplying manpower and machinery to go in there. Yeah. 3,000 ships, I don't know how many aircraft, and a million men going through this thing to get on the ground. Well, you know what? That's a great thing. And it, you know, you're landing on a beach, but where's all the supplies coming from? That was the that was the only thing that we were really trying to do at Normandy was establish a beachhead so we could bring supplies into Europe to feed mm -hmm. our guys on the ground. Yeah, yeah. Feed them, give them bullets, and get them some some fuel to get down the road. Yep. Supplies were just astronomically important. And when I went into the Navy, I had heard about underway replenishment, but I didn't, I spent two and a half years in the Navy before I really saw what was going on and saw how it worked. When we went over for Desert Storm, we traveled with our 13 combatants and we traveled with a half dozen or a dozen other support ships. And these guys, we had a hospital ship that transported with us just in case. We had um, several supply ships and we would get resupplied with food and fuel about every week and it's it's very interesting we carried eight helicopters on board our ship and when they get ready to do underway replenishment they'll bring in five or six supply ships 
all of our 13 ships are traveling in a, in a group together in battle formation. And what'll happen is you'll have 20 helicopters in the air from four different supply ships and they know where they're going. They'll go in and they'll hit, you'll have like six helicopters that will pick up 30 pallets of, of equipment from a supply ship, drop it on our deck. And then for the next 20 minutes, our deck is quiet, no helicopters, no aircraft. They're supplying all the other ships. And then we're clearing the deck with forklifts and manpower, trying to get that stuff cleared off the flight deck, get the cargo nets repackaged up. And then but when that last pallet leaves the, the flight deck going down for storage, the helicopters are lining up. They're getting ready to drop on us again. And it's a nonstop operation like that for eight, 10 hours. Hmm. And everybody on board the ship is involved. The air, air department has got all their aircraft in the air and the Marines and, and uh, the deck department and admin guys, and everybody is helping put food down below, try to get food back in the lockers and in the refrigerators and freezers, help get ammunition stowed away that we've used for uh, replacement ammunition we've used for training and practice and that kind of thing. Yeah. So everybody's got a job to do and they better do it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, well, sir. What was your job? I was a bosun's mate, uh, second class, uh, enlisted level five, E5. Uh, my primary job was uh, I was assigned to deck department and deck department handles all shipboard maneuvering and oper not really operations, but deck department. Um, we drove the ship. We ha operated the helm to, you know, drive the ship, get the ship through the water. We manned our uh, bridge lookouts and also we were responsible for the upper and lower vehicle stowage areas where the Marine Corps parked all of their vehicles. We were responsible for tying those down and making sure that they didn't get loose in rough seas and hurt somebody mm -hmm. or, or break something. Yeah. Okay. You have tie them down with chains or straps? Or uh, actually, we tied them down with uh, a very specific um, steel <coughs> cable. It's kind of like, it's got a, a okay. load binder on one end of it with, with deck plates in the in the deck where you could attach mm -hmm. it. They're all right. over the place. Right. Wrap a chain around the frame and, and tie it down. We had everything tied to the floor. Sure. Okay. So, uh, when you're on bridge uh, duty up there, you're just looking out for other things, or you was actually in the steering. Capacity? Actually, it was a rotating. It's a rotating watch. You typically stand a four-hour watch, and in that four hours, you will rotate through the four different positions. There's a five-man. It's a five-man bridge watch team from deck department that's up there. I mean, you got the officer of the deck and the conning officer, and then you got the, the quartermasters who handle navigation, get us where we need to go. You got mm -hmm. the operations guys that are handling all the radars and the, and the contacts and where everybody's at, making sure everybody's in the right positions. But deck department handles, we had uh, one guy on the helm, one guy on the engine order telegraph, which is the big handles that tells, you know, all, Speed. all that is is a, an indicator to tell the engine room what to do we want to go that way, we want to go fast. That's basically all it is. And then you got two uh, starboard bridge lookouts, and then we had one at the back end of the ship as well, an aft lookout. So you're at, your group was actually a, a command group, more or less. I can't really say command. When you say command to me, that's... that's um, I'm, I'm not taking it away from the captain. I'm, no, no. I'm, I'm just no. saying you guys saw the, the ship uh, operated. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You guys was in command that everything yeah. everything worked. Right, yeah. right. We kept her going. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I guess the uh, USS Independence and Eisenhower was there. Was was they near you? Was they in, in that group or? Uh, no, sir. We didn't. Uh, we didn't have. We had a helicopter carrier that went over with us. I believe it was the Iwo Jima. <laughs> And then uh, there was two other battle groups that were over there, two other carrier groups, and I and they were out operating off by themselves. The Persian Gulf looks, you look at it on a map and it looks really small based uh -huh. on, you know, put it up against the Pacific and it's tiny. Yeah. But it's still a big body of water. You sure. can get 20 miles away from somebody and never see them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just wondered how much action you've seen uh, during the storm. We, uh, during Desert Shield, which was the primary operation, or the, the that was our initial launching orders, was Desert <coughs> Desert Shield. We went over there to protect. Again, we went over there with a battle group, getting ready for a possible invasion. But we didn't know what exactly was going to happen. Maybe it was going to be solved diplomatically before we get in theater. Maybe not. So we're there in case of maybe not. Um, before 
desert storm actually started in January, we had made about 30 different landings in the countries on the east side of Africa as practice landings. And we would do that several different times for, you know, so that we knew exactly what had to happen and how it had to happen and when. Mm -hmm. We, uh, we did have one, um, typically our post where we were stationed at was about 80 or 90 miles off the coast because that gives a decent enough flight time for the helicopters to go in. We had some, we had some battle helicopters, we had some troop transport helicopters, and they would go in and, and we had some, um, the battle helicopters would go in and do close air support for the guys on the ground, and the, the troop transports would haul the guys in and out. Um, but at 90 miles or 100 miles out, it gave them enough time to get in, do what they needed to do, and get out and still have a buffer to get away. So that they could, so they could land on us and get refueled and rearmed and everything. Yeah. But you that would, that interval also gave you protection of small boats and everything coming out. You would, yes, sir. Have enough room there you could detect them. Yes, and sir. And we had some other smaller yourselves. ships. We had some destroyers and frigates with us that would go up and be running 10, 12 miles off the beach and running interference for us to protect yeah. us. Okay, understood. The USS Tripoli was another troop transport that actually hit a mine an undersea mine and blew a hole in the side of the ship they had to go to dry dock so we took their place at 11 miles off the beach and at night it's really at night on the sea is is very different than night anywhere else i mean you can go out into a cornfield in the middle of nebraska and you look out you're going to see a light somewhere you may not be able to see what it is or where it is but you can probably see a light somewhere mm -hmm. you get out in the middle of the ocean there is nothing it is dark, right? The visible horizon is at 20 miles. That's where the that's where the curve of the Earth starts going down, and you can't see what's on the other side of it. Uh -huh. After the Tripoli hit that mine, we went up to the 10 mile mark off the beach, and at night, from dusk until dawn, you could look out to the north and see Kuwait City burning. Mm. Mm, no kidding. That's a long ways away. Yeah. Yes, sir. How f how far from the beach was you to? Uh, <laughs> to, to unload the troops with that 20 miles 25 20. miles um, we tried to keep the interval from the from the launch platform to the beach kind of short the LCUs are good for getting on the beach but they're not real good for going long distances in open water they're pretty slow they're a little slow um, but I mean you got to remember most of the time they've got 150 troops on it or yeah. they've got two M60 tanks on them or they've got 10 trucks on them they're pretty heavily loaded so trying to get them in there efficiently and get them out, you stay in the 10 to 20 mile range so that they can get in there. You get unloaded and then you get out, you know? You go in, unload the car, and then you go park it somewhere. Yeah. It's like going to the mall. Yeah, you don't want to be set, set on the beach very long. You catch a mortar around or something. Correct, yeah, right. correct. You don't want to stay any closer than you have to for, for any amount of time. Sure. Right. Okay, now did you enjoy your tour of duty? I did. I loved it. You'd do it again? I would. I wouldn't hesitate. Well, if the circumstances was the same, <coughs> right? It's, yeah, I would do it again. No hesitation. Okay. Uh, that's good testimony to the services, what they, what they do for you. They, they did, did a lot for me. Um, they educated me. They trained me on how to do a lot of different things. I had... Um, at the time, when I went in, when I originally enlisted, I enlisted in advanced electronics, which at that time was very, very early computer repair, trying to keep the computerized gun mounts working and the radars and that kind of stuff. Didn't work out for me. I didn't make it through all the way through the classes and schoolings and everything, so I got sent out to the fleet as a non-designated person. I just went straight to deck department. So whatever they wanted to put you at, that's where they was going to stick you. Wherever they had an open hole, that's where I got kind of <laughs> stuck in. So I went there, but in that position, I learned, um, I learned. well, deck department's responsible for a lot of things, and tying the ship up when it gets to port, handling shorelines, handling cranes, forklifts, munitions, uh, equipment handling, logistics. Logistics is my thing. It's, that's what I'm, I'm good at, and mm -hmm. uh, that's what they trained me how to do. Uh, you was how old when you went in? 19. 19. Right out of school, pretty near? Pretty much. Yeah. Took, so, your, took your basic where? Uh, San Diego. San Diego. Yes, sir. Okay. 
So you, you grew up in the military and come out a man? Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I went into the military as a small person. I came out of boot camp as a big person. <laughs> I went in at 118 pounds of boot camp, and I came out small. of boot camp two months later at 180 pounds. Oh, wow. Okay, so they must have fed you good. <laughs> yes, they did. I had a special card in my pocket based on my, you know, everybody, when you go through boot camp, you're, you're put into a category. And the, the bigger guys, they get <coughs> a, a, a colored card in their pocket and they get... Food to reduce them? Food to reduce them. And the guys that were like me that were underweight, I could get double of build, anything yeah. on the line that I wanted. All I had to do was get this card out of my pocket and the guy in the, on the other side of the line, they're just dishing out food until I put the card back in my pocket. <laughs> I could eat anything I wanted all day long and it, it was good. So you picked up weight, but it was not fat, it was muscle, No, right? sir, it was not. It was not fat at all. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, when you, when you get there, first several days up to a week, week and a half is, uh, is <coughs> a entry, an, an entry group. You're, you're assigned to a barracks and a group. You're not necessarily in a company yet or in a training group yet. Right. And um, they issue your uniforms, they shave your head, you know, they go through all of that stuff. Well, they packed up all my civilian clothes and put them away, and then you give them back, the day before graduation. I tried my pants on that I was wearing when I went in there. <laughs> Who's were they? Yeah. Uh, well, I could get them on, but I- Were they tight? Uh, yes, sir. I couldn't squat down because my thighs had went from this to this. I, I tried to squat down and almost split the leg out of my pants. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I did a lot of walking. It was uh, three miles or four miles one way from our barracks to the, to the chow hall. <laughs> okay. So you do that three times a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it builds you up. Yes, sir. And that's, of course, what they was trying to do. Yes, sir. Okay. When you got out, did you join the fire department soon Soon after? I made the attempt to join the fire department soon after. It's, it's kind of hard to get on, into the fire department, into the fire service. I mean, Fort Wayne has only got 350-ish guys or yeah. guys and gals on the job. And um, when you have, uh, when I got hired in 97, there was 1,100 applicants for 30 positions. So it's, it's hard to get in. Yeah. Okay, a buddy of yours is on that camera that you're facing. Anything you want to say about him while he can't get to you? <laughs> He's a great guy. <laughs> <Okay>. Yes, he is. <laughs> okay. So a lot of training in the fire department. Yes, sir. To begin with. Yes, sir. Um, the training academy is, uh, it varies a little bit based on schedules and calendars, but it's average at 18 to 20 weeks of eight hours a day, five days a week yeah. um, to get through. Um, the first eight or 10 weeks is all medical training. They treat, teach you to bring you emergency medical technician. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, they bring you to that level first, and then they teach you all the fire stuff in the second half of the academy. Okay. I don't understand wearing all that heavy stuff when it's 90 degrees. <laughs> yeah, well, it's 90 degrees out here, but it's about 800 degrees in there, and you need, yeah. to, you need to keep from getting yeah. hurt once you get inside. Yeah. Yeah. We are the, uh, we're the crazy people. Most people run out of burning buildings, you know, you yelling in. and screaming, trying to get away from it. We run into burning buildings, yelling and screaming, trying to get into it. So, yeah. mm -hmm. our neighbor used to talk about screen door openers. Well, you got to go to the source, don't you? <laughs> yes, sir. We got to go get it at wherever it's at. Yeah. First one up, to open the screen door for the rest of them. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well. Hey, thanks for your service. And thank you for the service you're doing now. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah. Thank you for your yeah. service. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Yeah. Remember, uh, freedom is not free. <coughs> you see a veteran or someone in uniform, just walk up to them, shake your hand, say thank you for your service. Thank you for watching, and good night.
Access Fort Wayne offers reflections of our community.